Then you go back to your room. There are over seven million mentally ill and emotionally disturbed children in America. This program is about some of those children and the institutions they live in. Children of Darkness, next on nonfiction television. This program is made possible by a grant from the Independent Documentary Fund, which is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and public television stations, with additional funding from the following. This program contains language and sequences some viewers may find disturbing. His name is Brian. Along with 16 other mentally ill children, he's on a bus trip to the zoo. Brian believes that somebody is following him. A truck. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. That guy back there is driving me crazy. Oh, God. Oh, oh God, they dropped in. Oh, God. Oh, John Wax, you better stop that truck. John Wax, you better stop that truck. Brian suffers from mania and schizophrenia. He's been this way since he was four years old. Brian lives here, at Eastern State School and Hospital in Trevos, Pennsylvania. 160 children live with him. They're psychotic, schizophrenic. They suffer from organic brain damage and autism. Some are hyperactive, some totally withdrawn. Some are suicidal. I was trying to kill myself so I could be with my mother. That may be hard to understand, but I feel as though once you're dead, you'll be able to be with the other people that are also dead. I love her a lot. And I don't even know her, and that's what's so funny. Like, because I was so young when she died, I don't even know what she looks like or anything. But I just wish she was alive. I have an identity problem. My mom died, my father took off on me, and it hurts. It hurts a lot. When you started cutting at yourself, what was going on inside your head? I just wanted to die to be with my mom. I didn't care no more. I didn't care about nobody no more. Are you going to stay alive or are you going to die? That's a tough question to answer because I don't know. Sometimes I feel like killing myself. Other times I'm happy and I want to live forever. Jerry's parents are alive, but because of his muscular dystrophy and emotional problems, they didn't want him. My parents were ashamed to go out because of me. They were ashamed to take me out, you know. It's like, it's like I was a black sheep of the family. It's like tomorrow's his two year anniversary and his parents just more or less dropped him off here and said, you got him, see you later, and took off. When my mom brought me here, I seen her. And I, I ain't seen her since that day. Since that day she brought me in here, I have not seen her. And three days after, they took off from Las Vegas and just left, and left me here. And I didn't know for six months, because I was trying to come at home, and I got somebody else moved into our house. And six months later, they let me 
and they're the same they were out in Las Vegas. And then you enclosed it with a check for $20. I guess it's about time that I say something to the fact that they don't want me no more, and they never will, and that it's time for me to get out of here and make a life for myself, which I plan to do when I leave. Can you do it? Yes, I think I can. I think I can. Many of the children at Eastern are chronically mentally ill. They'll never see what we see, hear what we hear, think in ways we do. How much loot you got in there, son? Brian McAnally has lived at the hospital for the last four years. Oh, it's me. I want to go swim, that's what I want. Oh, wait. Yeah! Praise the Lord, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, right? thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I want you to lay down, please, Brian. Come on, I want you to lay down, okay? Don't get me sweat. I'm not going to get you sweaty. I just want you to lay down. Lay down, Mark. Because I think you need to relax. Okay. You're a little bit upset, okay? Okay. Wow. All right, I'll be outside the door if you need me, okay? It's a dentist's office. It's a dentist's office? Uh, hi, doctor. Do you know what's going on with him? What's the matter with him? You know what's going on? Not really. It's... Brian is... It's kind of scary. It's fun, the um, hottest is falling down. Brian's a very psychotic young man, and... Mark... So like I said, he was doing really, really well up until about a month or so ago, and I he started been, just regressing, been. going completely the opposite way. Yeah. Right. One more time, one more time, one more time. And then you go back in your room. There are over 7 million mentally ill and emotionally disturbed children in America. This program is about some of those children and the institutions they live in. Children of Darkness, next on Nonfiction Television. This program is made possible by a grant from the Independent Documentary Fund, which is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and public television stations, with additional funding from the following. This program contains language and sequences some viewers may find disturbing. His name is Brian. Along with 16 other mentally ill children, he's on a bus trip to the zoo. Brian believes that somebody is following him. A truck. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. A truck's following us. That guy back there is driving me crazy. Oh, God. Oh, oh God, they dropped in. Oh, God. Oh, John White, you better stop that truck. John White, you better stop that truck. Oh, Very so good, good now. Oh, okay, I can dance. Why don't you stay in here for a few okay. minutes, okay? Thank, thank you. Mr. Don. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Sit down. I'll call you Tank. Okay. I'll be back in a couple okay. minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Don. It's, it's perfect. I, yeah. What the hell does it all mean? I mean, you're here tackling kids, holding them to bed, sticking needles in them. Is that, is that uh, psychotherapy? What's going on? It's the best we got. I'm serious. It's, it's the best that we have. I mean, there are other institutions that, you know, may be a little bit better. There may be a little bit more staff, but I've worked in enough institutions to know that this is, you know, it's the best system we got. And nobody's come up with a better system yet. Is everything that's going on upsetting you, Brian? Yeah, uh, the walls yeah. are cracking. The walls are cracking. Oh my God, look.
Raphael, walk with the group, please. Eastern State is the largest children's state psychiatric hospital in America. This year's budget is for $13.5 million. That's $84,000 per year per child. For this, each one gets food, medication, and a place to sleep. For those who could benefit from it, there is almost no one-to-one -one or any other form of psychotherapy. The major therapy at Eastern is drugs. Almost every child there gets some form of psychotropic medication. I like to go swimming. Medication that alters the brain's chemistry in an attempt to control psychotic behavior. Olivia Lakes. Olivia Lakes. He's a like my boy. He is mildly retarded. I'm not retarded. I'm retarded, well, right? In the sense of the word. Um, retarded. Some is due to uh, environmental conditions at home. Uh, Brian was a, was a product, I think, of an unplanned pregnancy. He was abandoned by his mother. He's never, never seen her. You know. Father is very much involved, very loving. He's coming to Very concerned tonight, right? as to what his future will be. Brian! All right, Brian. I look forward to every Sunday for Brian. It's my day. Sunday is my day. Sunday's the day Jim McAnally and his son have spent together for the past four years. It's the day Brian gets to go home. Most Sundays, Linda Nixon comes along too. She grew up next door to Brian, and he likes to think of her as his girlfriend. Mr. McAnally lost his leg in an automobile accident when he was 19. Now he's 70 years old and has had two serious strokes. When Brian's illness became too much for him to handle, Jim had to give him up to the hospital. But for the first 14 years of Brian's life, Jim raised him in this house in East Philadelphia. During the Depression, Jim earned a living selling bananas, oranges, and strawberries from a horse-drawn wagon. On the streets of Philadelphia, they called him the Huckster. Brian, sit down a minute. <laughs> All right, come on. I'm going to do the huckster for you. Okay. All sound, solid tomatoes, new white potatoes, hard heads, a lettuce, fresh cabbage, string beans, bananas, three pounds for a quarter. Be right there, lady. Yeah. <laughs> remember Fritz ate your leg off? Yeah, I remember that too. Sure, Fritz, somehow Fritz ate your leg off. No, I was laying on the couch taking a nap. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen to Brian when I die? I don't know what's going to happen. Who's going to go take Brian out on Sunday or a Saturday? Who's going to bring him home for the holidays and show him the love and care that I show him? Maybe that's one of the reasons I shower him with affection now, to try to give him everything that I possibly can now, knowing that when I'm gone, he won't get it. Yet, Brian is uh, taken care of financially. He won't want, but he will want love and affection. He will want love and affection. Where is he going to get it? Where is he going to get it? <laughs> it's like a parade. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Brian in my eyes. Hi, Grandpa. Nothing at all. He's just a normal person to me. See, other people think he's, you know, there's something wrong with him. But in my eyes, there's nothing wrong with Brian. Doug wants to go in the camera, too. Too many people tease Brian now. Too many people do. And I don't like it. So I stick up for him. What can I do? I think a lot of Brian. A lot. I really do. I think a lot of Brian. A peaceful and happy life for Brian. That's all I can ask for. God will see fit to take care of him, watch over him, and uh, <clears throat> that he doesn't have any heartaches more than he has now. One day, if he's lucky, Brian may go to a group home for the mentally ill. But there are just five in all of Pennsylvania, with just 45 young people living in them. So it's more likely that when Brian's too old for Eastern, he'll be sent to an adult institution. The 
hardest part of my day is Sunday when I take him back to school. Knowing that I'm going home to an empty house when Brian should be with me. When Brian should be with me. And I have everything in Brian's room as if he's with me every day. When I go past that bed, I can picture Brian in it. When I'm going to bed at night, I can picture Brian in it. And it hurts. And it hurts. That's when I pray for him. You know where you're at now, Brian? Brian? What? Do you know where you're at now? School. That's right. And are you going to be good for Dad? Yeah. That's right. All right, let's go. Brian, come on. Kiss Linda. God love you. And uh, let me shake hands with Dad. Okay. I love you, Dad. I love you too, honey. I love you a lot. Okay. Good night. Good night, honey. I'm gonna walk him over, Jim. All right, honey. This is the hardest part of the day. Just bring him back here, knowing that I won't see him till next week. There's no Brian in the bed upstairs. I can't tell you anymore. like a baby, you get screamed at. If you want to act as more like a mature adolescent, you get talked to. One of the things that we do here is we don't bullshit kids. We don't tell kids that this is some kind of utopia, that everything is going to work out for you, that when you leave here, everything is going to be roses. We don't tell them that out there is a nice place either, because it's not. You know, you don't even have enough self-esteem, okay? You don't make sure things get done! So I suggest for the next time, you should put more quality on it! The name of the place is Elan. It's a private, residential treatment center for out-of-control teenagers. What you're watching is called a haircut. If you break one of the rules, or your attitude isn't right, you get yelled at. Let me tell you something, Martha. Put your hand in it. It's unacceptable. Why can't people accept me for me? The teenagers who come here are not mentally ill. Psychiatric hospitals don't work for them. They're alcoholics, drug addicts, and drug pushers. They're teenagers who have victimized others and themselves. I just, you know, I treated myself like scum, I was scummy. I sold myself to men who I didn't even know, didn't even care, you know, they didn't care about me. I just wanted what they wanted. And, and it's like a piece of meat, you know, to be blunt. The kids at Elan are almost all white, from upper middle class and wealthy homes. Their parents pay more than $20,000 a year to send them here for treatment. But these are children who have acted out, often violently, against their parents. Mike turned around and gave his mother the finger and said, fuck you. Um, I looked at Mike, and I, I don't recall what I said, but it probably was something like, don't you dare talk to your mother like that. And he turned around and swung at me. You got to think about how you'd feel if you had a 16-year-old kid who is six foot one, who's, who's come to the conclusion that he's going to do whatever he wants to do. When I brought Mike here today, I, I just cried. And I knew, and, and the people in school knew that he was coming up here to stay. You know that if he doesn't change, he's going to get arrested. 
you know that sooner or later he's going to steal something to get money. The phone rings at 10 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning. You're shaking. You're wondering, what's this call going to mean? Is it the police? And that's the fear that we live in. We're ready to, to uh, crack. This is an example. Ready to crack. I love him so much. I wouldn't want to lose him. I can't tell you. I don't want to lose that camera because I cry all the time. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, you're the first one to do it! Yes, day in, day out, yes, life at Elan is constant yes, confrontation. Yes, you want your best on the Unrelenting I pressure. I couldn't believe all the shit that was left on those things. Your feelings, yeah, your negative out. attitudes are broken down, dissected, torn apart. The idea is to change your behavior. It's good, John. Elan residents are taught to obey authority. They're made to work at menial jobs to do what they're told to do. Other Elan residents enforce the rules. They record the names, the actions of everyone in every room continuously. At Elan, there is no privacy. Incoming mail is opened. Outgoing mail is read and censored. Telephone calls are monitored. Every conversation is subject to eavesdropping and informing. I want a drink and I want it right now. In therapy, your problems, your hang-ups right are all laid bare. I want a drink and I want it right now! I want a drink and I want it right now! I want a drink and I want it right now! I want a drink and I want it right now! I want a drink and I want it right now! I just, when I feel like that, it's like there's nothing holding me back. I'm so out of control that I can't stand it. And it's, and it's like, I get really mad, you know? I think, because I know exactly what I'm doing, but I still want it. You know, I don't give, I don't care about anything else but that. Before I came to Elan, about six months before, I had like three suicide attempts in a row. And, uh, it was in the back of my mind that, you know, if I drink again and if I go as far as I've gone before, I'm not going to be living anymore. Diane comes from a prominent Tucson family. She was a straight A student and won a scholarship to the University of Arizona. But drinking and drugs became problems she couldn't control. We're talking about attempting suicide by eating 15 pills of antabuse and then going out and having a glass of scotch. We're talking about waking up in the morning and just because you don't have booze, drinking shaving lotion just to get alcohol out of it. Okay, we're talking about going into convulsions and going into seizures and going into blackouts that you almost never came out of. I was at the point where I was pretty wasted one night and I went out and I got a butcher knife and, you know, started stabbing myself in my stomach, which partly because I wanted my father to, you know, come and say, it's okay, Diana, you know, you're going to be all right. You know, you're a very sick little girl. We'll take you to the hospital and, you know, sew you up. And uh, I just wanted him to know that he loved me because I felt like he didn't. I felt like nobody did. You have to make the decision whether or not it's worth it for you to live. You have got to do it for yourself. And I want you to think about the times that you could never sit somebody down and spill your guts out. And I want you to say, I'm lonely and it hurts me. Hold hands and think about that. I mean, let's get in touch with what you are. I'm lonely and it hurts me. Think about that, Diane. Think I'm about lonely that. Come on. And it hurts me. Think about what goes on inside. I'm lonely and it I'm hurts me. Let's go. I'm lonely and it hurts me. Come on. I'm lonely and it hurts me. I'm lonely and it hurts me. I'm lonely and it hurts me. Tell us about it. I'm lonely and it hurts me. I'm lonely and it hurts me. I'm lonely and it hurts me. Get it all out. Get it all out. It's okay to cry. When I say 
down, you drop your hands, and you all say no. 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 At Elan, you succeed and survive if you accept the program. If you don't, there are punishments. They're usually called learning experiences. Residents are made to wear signs for days, sometimes weeks, bluntly spelling out their problems and failures. If their behavior is deemed infantile, they're made to wear diapers over their clothes and to carry rattles. If they become hostile or act out, they're put into a ring. There they have to physically fight one Elan resident after another until they're beaten and give in to the group. We weren't permitted to film the ring and a lot more at Elan. We weren't supposed to film the boys you're looking at now. When they refused to participate in the Elan program, they were put in this dumpster filled with garbage. They've been living in it for two weeks. The boy outside the dumpster is guarding them. If they escape, he'll be put inside. Many Elan residents have tried to escape, but they've all failed. When they've managed to get off the grounds, trackers are sent out after them. When they caught this 15-year-old boy, he was put in a rabbit suit and leg shackles. Why did they put you in chains and in a rabbit suit? Because I ran away. When they put him on me, they told me you know, that they were going to be on me you know, until I left. But, you know, it's been two weeks so far. What does it do? Okay, it humiliates him and it restricts his movement. He's run away from here four times, okay? He's run away from every place he's been before at least 17 or 18 times. I'm not, I won't run away again. I told him that, I told him I won't run away again, but if they were gonna put me in jail, you know, you know, they'd put me in jail, but they wouldn't, you know, they'd have to make me walk around with shackles on. This boy's been in and out of juvenile detention centers for years and faced charges of breaking and entering and assault. For him, it was either Elan or jail. The kid has no idea what prison is like. Somebody has got to introduce to him some realistic concepts of what's ahead of him, and he's gonna hit jail if he doesn't change. What's gonna happen to him? He's five foot six, he's got bright orange hair and blue eyes. How long is he gonna last in jail? I'm not a dog, I'm not a... I'm not even a person anymore, you know. This is supposed to be America, you know. I still, I still have rights as a human being to walk around. And I can't even do that with these things on. Those things stay on him. He decides how long they stay on him, not me. He makes that decision. If he came up to his director tomorrow and said, I want to get back involved, I want to change, okay? I want to participate, I want to try again, they would come off like that. Okay, if he wants to act like a criminal, he'll be treated like a criminal. It's that basic. Now, if that is robbing him of his dignity and robbing him of his freedom, then yes, I'm guilty of it. Elan claims its graduates are now leading happy, productive lives, that they're staying in school, going to college and working. The drug use is way down and criminal involvement cut by more than half. But parents of some former residents dispute these claims. When Rhode Island parents complained, the state investigated and found that of 117 former Elan residents from that state, 70 had been arrested and that one is serving a life sentence for murder in South Carolina. Nevertheless, this year, parents from more than 22 states and eight foreign countries will send 200 of their children to Elan for treatment. In the United States today, five million acutely mentally ill children need treatment of a very different kind. Half a million are psychotic, two million schizophrenic, one in five suffers from depression. They need immediate psychiatric help, usually in hospitals. For most Americans, private psychiatric hospitalization isn't possible. The cost for one child can be as much as $120,000 a year. Medical insurance doesn't come close to paying for it. For poor, middle class, even well-to-do families with children in need of long-term care, after savings run out, 
there's usually just one place left to go. The state hospital. In our country, 20,000 children are admitted to them every year. These young men are autistic. They came to Sagamore Children's Center in New York when they were five or six. Now they're 17, 18, some are 22 years old. Many have lived at this state hospital for more than 14 years. You don't have a pencil, you need a pencil. Joe Romagna teaches autistic children at Sagamore. He's been doing it for the last 12 years. Many of the children in Joe's class get some form of psychotropic medication. The drugs Howard gets control his epileptic seizures, but their side effects can put him to sleep. Let me see, anybody in here? There he is, there he is, all right. Feel any better? You ready to do some schoolwork? Come on, let me give you some work to do. You make me earn my pay, Howard. I can't have you sleeping here. I can't have you sleeping here. That's too easy. That's too easy, Howard. Let's see. I'm going to wake you up. All right, Howard. Let's try this, buddy. Let's try this. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Why don't you wash your face? Go ahead. Uh oh, this is gonna hurt. Look out, what a shot. Oh, oh. What I hope for for them is that they can be happy and be taken care of uh, all the time. I don't have hope for all of them they will be like you and me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible at this point. You take a kid who's 18, 19 years old, hasn't learned yet to speak, uh, can't write his name yet. Uh, you know, I don't I have hope that they're gonna be totally normal. I can't say that I always felt that way. When these kids were seven and eight, I used to think so. A specific kid, I would say, yeah, this kid is going to, he'll make it, he'll be, you know, he'll straighten out, he'll be a lot better off than this. But, you know, 12 years later, I see a kid almost the same as he was, you know, he's gotten a little bigger, you know, he shaves now, or somebody shaves him, you know, but he's not totally, uh, he's not a, not a hell of a lot better than he used to be. Autism, as far as researchers know, may be caused by brain damage, organic brain disease, or by genetic factors. One hypothesis is that autistic children inherit a lack of resistance to a virus that destroys part of their brains. A child can be born with autism, or it can take as long as three years to appear. But early on, there's usually a feeling, a recognition that something is not right with your child. Spell Lisa for me. Spell Lisa for me, Lisa. Now put your pencil down a minute. Why don't you spell Lisa for me? Don't write it, spell it. How do you spell Lisa? What letter did you start with? L. Good. Then what's next? I. Uh-huh. Then what? K. No. That's a different word. You look at the wrong word. Spell Lisa for me. L. Good. I. Yes. What's after I? Lisa. L. I. S. Good. Then what's next? A. Good girl. Very nice. Lisa, okay. What's the next word we have? So much effort for so little. A lot of people say that. A lot of people say that. Uh, it's not a little to me. It's not a little. It's not a little. A kid, you know, he's a kid. And, uh, you know, he deserves a chance to, to be here like everybody else. He deserves a chance to get better, you know, to enjoy himself. What are you doing, Howard? Kids need, need to have somebody close to them. And it's important to me, uh, while I'm doing what I'm doing, that I'm close to the kids too. Come on. Uh, they are, a lot of them, very special to me, the kids. Some, some more than others, the ones I know longer, you know. I feel very close to them. I have no plan to do anything but this for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm certainly comfortable doing this. I, 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 I get a good feeling and work with these ki kids and uh, I think I'm doing something for them. And I, I think they appreciate me. You know. Why do we send you to school for? Because I'm here. Oh, you character. Sometimes you can bother me, but sometimes you gotta do your work, right? Right? You didn't do any work. In a way, I think they love me. Uh, like I said, uh, they, they can't tell me that, but it's uh, possible. 100,000 children in America have autism. Most of them live a normal lifespan. They grow up, they grow old, but they usually don't get better. And they can get much worse. The boy
boy's name is Billy Calhoun. He was admitted to Sagamore's autistic unit when he was seven. Now he's 20. Billy was transferred to the Sagamore infirmary after he became self-abusive. He's lived here in restraints for the past two and a half years. For this one, we haven't found an answer yet, and we've been working very hard at it. He's uh, beaten himself in every part of his body. He's thrown himself into the ground, into the floor, uh, torn at his body with his hands. He's rubbed himself against objects to, the, to raw skin. He's beaten his head to the point of detaching his retina. Not once, but twice. Uh, any way that, that I could think of that he could abuse himself and injure himself, he's done it. Why is this child? Why did God create it? Uh, that's all I've always wondered, you know. What does it mean? It has to have a meaning. Everything has a meaning. What is his meaning? Why is Billy here? I don't know. It's all right, Billy. It's okay, Billy. Come on. Three times a day, Billy Calhoun is made to walk so his muscles don't deteriorate. The rest of the time, he's kept tied up. During those walks, he's watched carefully because of his previous violence towards the staff. Doctors at Sagamore have tried drugs and special diets to try to help him. But so far, nothing has worked. Now they're considering more radical treatment, including aversive shock therapy. A device is applied to the body, which produces a, a very intense, painful reaction. I've been told that it's, it's like, it's a type of pain which you don't know. It's not like sticking your hand in a socket. The idea would be to stop his self-destructive behavior using pain as a punishment. And if Billy's condition doesn't improve, Sagamore doctors say they'll reluctantly consider a lobotomy. A lobotomy, to my knowledge, is irreversible and destroys part of the organism. But I suppose that if it came down to the point where there absolutely were no other alternatives, then I can see where that, that could be a consideration if it meant keeping him alive. He's coping, I guess. But don't let it get any worse where he's miserable all the time. If he's not going to get any better, fine. But if he gets sick, as bad sickness, make it a sickness that would take him, as opposed to a lingering, any more pain. In this business, there's no guarantees of success. We're not God. We're the hospital. We're trying to do the very best we can. What about making him better? I can't do it. I can't do it now. I'd like to find a way. We all would. Many years ago, there was a member of our family that uh, has handicapped children. And she went to church and asked the priest, why me? And uh, she said, the priest said to her, don't you know God looks all over the world to give these problems to, and he never gives them to anyone who can't handle them. That was very satisfying to me. I thought, OK, there's my answer. I didn't ask for this. We never knew that we had handicapping conditions in the family. And they're showing up in this, these generations. And uh, I figured, OK, if that's what you gave me, I guess you figure I can handle it. So it's just the way we've lived it. More than half of the children you've seen in this film will retain their illnesses into adult life, and most of them will be sent to adult institutions. For parents, what looms ahead is frightening. A realization that their children may never get well, that their lives may be spent in institutions. And there are other fears. Fears that come from giving up control of your child's life. And of placing that life in the hands of strangers. In the United States, more than 500 mental patients, including teenagers and children, 
die each year in hospitals for reasons that are questionable or unexplained. Three of those deaths, all involving young people and all under strikingly similar circumstances, took place at South Beach Psychiatric Center in New York. August 13, 1979, Anthony Ruggieri, a severely depressed young man, was sent to South Beach by his parents. Within 10 days, Anthony Ruggieri was dead. October 10, 1980, 19-year-old Judy Singer arrives at South Beach. She dies six days later. At South Beach, both Judy and Anthony were tied down in straitjackets. Both of them were placed in seclusion rooms. Both were given massive amounts of psychotropic drugs. According to South Beach records, Anthony's order was for more than eight times the maximum daily recommended dose. The doctor who ordered Anthony's medication and who supervised Judy Singer's treatment just before her death was Dr. Jonathan Kane, chief of service for the South Beach Intensive Care Unit. On that unit, South Beach patients told us that not only were drugs and straitjackets used to control patients, patients were also made to wear football helmets as a punishment if they talked too much, sometimes for days. One South Beach patient who was on the intensive care unit with Judy Singer remembers seeing her tied to a pole just before her death. She let us tape her voice in an isolated part of the hospital grounds on a windy day. She was sitting in a spray jacket tied off to the pole. She was crying for help, for help, for help. And they, they didn't do nothing. She said she had to go to the bed. They wouldn't let her. When she wanted to go to the bed, they wouldn't let her go. And she, had, she did it right there, you know, in her pen. It's terrible. She wanted to get out of the spray jacket. They said, sit still, or, or they're gonna put the, we're going to put the helmet on your head. You know, the football helmet. It's not treatment, it sounds more like torture. To put them in the middle of a room, tie them to a post and let them defecate on the floor. That's not treatment. I don't care what one's behavioral philosophy is. Clinical medical practice. Dr. Paul Casadante is clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and teaches at the New York University Medical School. What it shows is, as, as I say, at best a carelessness. What it shows at worst is a perverse inconsideration of all of the good principles of medical practice that we all were taught. She wanted to get out of it. She was, you know, struggling. And, and she, she slided down on the floor, you know, so she started crying. You have to take her out of the straitjacket, I said, because she can't sit there. She's turning blue. But they wouldn't listen. Eleven months after Judy Singer's death on his unit, Dr. Jonathan Kane was reassigned to treat patients in another part of the hospital. Two years after Anthony Ruggieri's death and 10 months after Judy Singer's, 17-year-old Andrew Zamora was admitted to South Beach. He was agitated, withdrawn, suspicious. His diagnosis, acute paranoid disorder. At home, Andrew painted. He kept to himself. He wrote poetry and listened to music. But Andrew had problems connecting with people he didn't seem to know how to fit in, and he believed people were going to hurt him. Andrew had been to South Beach before, and he was afraid to go back, afraid of the drugs he was given, the spasms they caused in his arms and legs. He was afraid of being put in a straitjacket. But as he became more agitated, his parents reluctantly decided to admit him. For the two days that followed, the Zamoras were not allowed to speak to their son, they were not allowed to visit him. They were told nothing about his treatment. On the third day, August 17th at 5 p.m., Dr. Jonathan Kane, who was the on-call psychiatrist for emergencies that day, went to a phone at South Beach and dialed the Zamora's home number. I received a call from the hospital. They were sending a police car down to me. It was an emergency situation, and I got hysterical. And I said, what sort of emergency situation? And Dr. Kane refused to tell me. He said, I want you to come down to the hospital, and I'll explain it to you then. Uh, we got there, and as soon as I got in, he said, I guess as you expected, Andrew is dead. 
I said, as I expected, I couldn't believe it. I said, how could my healthy child be dead? I said, you gave him something he shouldn't have received. What did you give him? He says, I don't know. I'll have to look up the medication. According to South Beach records, along with other drugs, Andrew was injected with Thorazine. His mother had warned the South Beach staff he'd been given it before and that its side effects were devastating. But he was injected with it anyway. Following that, he began biting his tongue and moaning. But hospital records show the staff believed he was faking a reaction to the drug, and a canvas bed net was thrown over him and tied down to the corners of his bed. I hate this thing that happened to my son, a healthy child, full of life, and the, I bring him then, him then, then, then two days before, and now he's dead. We asked South Beach for an explanation. Three young people enter the hospital, and within a few days, each of them is dead. But Dr. Lucy Ray Sarkis, director of South Beach, wouldn't answer our questions. The chief of the intensive care unit, Dr. Jonathan Kane, refused to be interviewed. The commissioner of mental health for New York State denied our request to film conditions at the hospital. And Sarah Connell, regional director for New York City, told us, quote, we don't have anything to say about South Beach and we're not going to. But there were people who worked there who did want to talk about South Beach. Anybody could die there. Anybody could, could come into an overcrowded, understaffed unit and react so badly that they could die. Anybody. People got medicated to the point that they became zombies. I remember seeing people drooling from the mouth, people uh, unable to control urinary until they got to the bathroom or defecation, totally lost control of those muscles. I just questioned a lot of things going on. I mean, under the name of uh, mental health, I felt the people who were labeled patients were used as experiments. They were like guinea pigs. On August 17th, Andrew Zamora was injected three times with Sorrental, a powerful psychotropic drug. One of Sorrental's side effects is to disrupt the body's ability to cool itself. Andrew was in a room where the air conditioner was turned off. The windows were sealed shut. Andrew was kept tied down as the heat in the heavy canvas bed net became unbearable. Just imagine what it's like that you're sweating, that the heat is building up inside of that canvas bag, that there's very little means of your perspiring other than through your head. Uh, Imagine what it's like to be struggling against that. I'm angry. I'm angry because I think my son suffered. And I, it hurts me. I can't stand to think that somebody would treat somebody else like that. A good portion of the time I see him as potential sources of aggravation for me. There's nobody that I'm dealing with that I love. And just to be sure that I don't feel any sort of attachment like that, I just go to the opposite extreme. I still have a hard time seeing the people I'm dealing with as, as people. Andrew had no control over his tremors now, the muscle spasms. His eyes rolled back in his head. And now the staff had second thoughts about him faking a reaction to the drugs. So they gave him more medication to try to control the side effects. By that time, though, drugged and tied down. What had happened to Anthony Ruggieri and Judy Singer before was happening now to Andrew Zamora. And at 4.45 p.m., he was dead. If I said they killed him, would I be wrong? That indicates to me a deliberate attempt on the part of the staff. If I said they let him die, would I be wrong? That you would not be wrong. I tried for eight years putting in reports about that place. And I just quit because it fell on deaf ears. No one wanted to hear it. We have had patients hang themselves in a six-foot closet. Two of them. They just walked inside the closet, tied something around their neck, put it on the hook, and just sat down and hung themselves to death. Where was the staff? I hope that God has Andrew with him and at peace. I have this feeling when I was at Mass today, it was such a beautiful Mass, that he 
was at peace and he was with God. I, I believe that there has to be a better world in this life because I think there's too much suffering and pain in this life and after we die there has to be a better world and I'd like to believe I'd have some peace in my lives if I could believe that Andrew's happy now and is in a better world than he left. The most thing I can love in my life is my son. Very much. And I can even express I am suffering now because of him and I blame myself for his death and I love him very much, very much. I can even, I don't have the words to express the love of my, my son. The most important thing in my life today is to communicate with my son. Communicate. And I want him to tell me, Daddy, you're right. You was a nice man. You, you're not guilty of my death. But then now when I don't have my son, God, you help me. Help me talk to him. Help me talk to him. And telling him all the wrongs I did to him that I feel sorry. They cannot, he cannot help me. When I look at him in the funeral parlor, I talk to him, he cannot talk to me. And now I want you to be between him and me and telling me what he feel about me. In the year and a half since Andrew Zamora died, there have been 62 more patient deaths at South Beach. New York State is currently investigating 14 of those deaths, which they consider questionable and unexplained. Dr. Jonathan Kane, Chief of Service of the South Beach Intensive Care Unit, resigned three months after Andrew died. What I think this should serve to show is that without careful clinical supervision, without well-trained people, without people who are interested and concerned with their work, that incidents like this can happen. We need people to take a more active interest in the mental health system, and not just the patient advocates who get up there with cardboard posters and protest all treatment, uh, and who throw rocks at the gates of the state hospitals but rather people to take an active interest in staffing the hospitals and improving the quality of care and not just hoping that things will get better because hope will not do it, no matter how deep. Are you gonna stay alive or are you gonna die? That's a tough question to answer because I don't know. Sometimes I feel like killing myself, other times I'm happy and I want to live forever. Denise ran away from Eastern State Hospital just before her 18th birthday. Neither hospital officials or friends know where she is or what's happened to her. It's time for me to get out of here and make a life for myself, which I plan to do when I leave. Can you do it? Yes, I think I can. I think I can. Jerry did leave Eastern State and is now living by himself in a small Pennsylvania town. So far, he's been unable to find a job, but he's determined to stay out of the hospital and to make it on his own. I'm going to do the huckster for you. Okay. All sound, solid tomatoes, new white potatoes, hard heads, of lettuce, fresh cabbage, string beans, bananas, three pounds for a quarter. Be right there, lady. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Fritz ate your leg off? Yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> Brian McAnally is now 18 years old, old enough to be sent to an adult psychiatric hospital. But recently he's been accepted by a new group home now under construction in Philadelphia. When Brian moves in, he'll live just four blocks away from his father's home. After 18 months at Elan, Diane graduated in the summer of 1982. Now she works as a secretary and plans to go back to college. But when she's lonely or depressed, she still drinks. Why is this child? Why did God create it? And that's all I've always wondered, you know. Why is Billy here? I don't know. 
Billy Calhoun has not been given aversive shock therapy or a lobotomy. Although he still lives in the Sagamore Infirmary, now he's out of restraints 13 hours a day. For the past year, the Sagamore staff has worked intensely with Billy, rewarding him with praise and affection for not hurting himself. And his self-abusive behavior is almost gone. Billy's improved so much that now he's able to attend a special school with other children. It's the best we got. I'm serious. It's, it's the best that we have. I mean, there are other institutions that, you know, may be a little bit better. There may be a little bit more staff, but I've worked in enough institutions to know that this is, you know, it's the best system we got. And nobody's come up with a better system yet. In this business, there's no guarantees of success. We're not God. We're the hospital. We're trying to do the very best we can. What I hope for for them is that they can be happy and be taken care of uh, all the time. I don't have hope for all of them they will be like you and me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible at this point. You take a kid who's 18, 19 years old, hasn't learned yet to speak, uh, can't write his name yet. Uh, you know, I don't I have hope that they're going to be totally normal. I have no plans to do anything but this for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm certainly comfortable doing this. I, 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 I get a good feeling and I work with these ki kids and... Uh, I think I'm doing something for them, and I, I think they appreciate me, you know.